Okay, so it's a privilege to be with you and to be able to present to you something about a new hot topic which is called impedance control. And some of you may have come or may not have come across that. Those who have come across that know what it is. So it's actually like uh, either you know it or you don't know it. There is no half knowledge about that. And well, I will be bothering you with a little bit of formulae. However, I will try to keep that short and uh, as, li uh, as little painful as possible. So, um, as a starter, uh, to introduce mechanical impedance, first thing is you, you say something about electrical impedance. And so electrical impedance is first about saying I have a power and I can divide the power um, into two quantities. And this guy I said it was uh, a voltage and a current. And if I say I can divide it into that quantity, so I say the product of voltage and current is power. And then you can make more fun and you say, okay, you divide voltage and current, and then you get a resistance. And okay, then you say, well, if uh, voltage and current may be complex, then you say, okay, um, I have an impedance. And I think most of you who have electrical background understand this concept. Um, what you say is actually that if you have a complex impedance, if you have, for example, an imaginary impedance, that one quantity is leading the other. And so, for example, an inductor, there the voltage is leading the current, or with a capacitor, the current is leading the voltage. And as you see also that the impedance for something which has 90 degrees here increases with frequency, and with minus 90 degrees it actually decreases with frequency. And this is not a hazard, it's something which can mathematically be proven that there is a relationship between the angle and the curvature of the impedance, at least for what you call minimum phase networks. And we will come back later to that also because it's quite important. Now, um, you go to what we call the Laplace domain, and most people are familiar with S or with J omega. I will stick with J omega later on. So J omega is actually the imaginary unit and omega is the frequency or two pi times the frequency. So enough of that. Now the question is? Okay. Now, to put it a little bit in graphics, you see here with a real impedance, you have the voltage and the current in phase and the power actually has the double frequency and has a medium value of half the product or half the peak value. Now, for a capacitor, you have this out phasing and so there is a power, but it, it's going back and forth. So you have a negative power, a positive power, negative power, positive power like this here, and the medium power is zero. And so you say that the power is kind of what you call an imaginary power or an apparent power, but there is no real power about that. And the same thing with an inductor, just that the phases are different. So you see here the voltage is leading the current, so voltage comes before current, and here again you see no real power, so the medium value of the power is zero. And now for mechanical impedance, let's put the same thing. We say, okay, we have something which is force times velocity, that's power. So we have again split power into two quantities. And one is force and one is velocity. You could split it also in other quantities, but let's stick with this here because um, what comes out of that is quite handy. And now we do the same thing. We divide force by velocity. We could also divide velocity by force. It's a convention that you divide force by velocity. And so we stick with that because that's the common definition. Again, mathematics is much more flexible than we as engineers, but we have our convention, so let's stick with the convention that is there. And so we say, okay, uh, the mechanical impedance is the force divided by the velocity, or to be more concrete, we say the differential mechanical impedance is the derivative of the force to the velocity. And so this is something where you can also introduce things like negative impedances and so on and so forth. Yeah, so you have a positive force, positive velocity, but you have a decreasing force with the velocity. 
and this is a negative impedance. And everybody knows that who has played a cello or a violin. A violin has this colophone and it has actually a negative impedance and that's the reason why we have an oscillator and why we can play music. So this has all implications. And let's say the same thing, we have a damper and the damper has a damping constant and this is F over V. We have a mass and the mass has a mechanical impedance of J omega M and a spring has a mechanical impedance of the spring constant over J omega. So we can say, well, um, there's an analogy between the Z meg here of the C is equal to an R in electrical engineering and the mass is in equivalent to a Henry in inductance and a spring is something like one over K is then the C, the capacitance. So, and then we see here the analogy and Okay, well, let's go to the next thing because now it becomes uh, less, less mathematical. So that was the concept. So the concept is mechanical impedance, something like a spring constant or a damper or something like that. So you can say it's an apparent stiffness of the mechanics. It's apparent resistance against any kind of motion. Yeah, so a damper gives you resistance against motion. That's a real impedance. It's a dissipation of energy. And where do we need that? We need that actually where robots are normally uh, in environments which are not structured. So for example, if you have a structured environment like something where you turn, there you want to have precision and then you want to have something which is extremely hard and very stiff. And most engineers have learned in control theory how to make stiff control. Yeah? Everything as stiff as possible. And if it's not stiff enough, then you use a gear. And if it's not stiff enough, then you use some reinforcements. And there are other areas where you don't want to have that. That's uh, what I would call the terminator effect. Yeah? So yeah, a robot goes to something and then kills it immediately. Yeah? That, that's what you don't want, actually, normally, in the environment. And so um, you want to adapt your impedance. That means you want to become as soft as your environment and that adaptive, adaptively. For example, um, if we slam into a door, yeah, I think that some people have already had this kind of collision experience with a door, but uh, all of you are still alive. Yeah? And what, what happens in that moment? Yeah, you collide with the door and everything in your body changes so that it becomes soft. And by this, you minimize your impact energy. And proof positive of this changing of impedance is actually in martial arts. Yeah, in martial arts, you do everything to circumvent your natural programming. So natural, martial arts, you actually learn to become very hard in the body because normally if you hit somebody, you be, would become soft yeah, and you, you couldn't kill the people. Yeah? In order to kill somebody, you really have to override everything which is in your hardware to become as hard as you can. Yeah? So our natural way is to change impedance according to the environment. Yeah, if I want to climb a rock, you become quite hard here. You get very strong hands. But if you want to just, just you know, a shake hands, you will have a, a not so firm grip. Yeah, that's, that's the way things are. So robots need to learn that. So for us, it's completely natural. For robots, it's absolutely unnatural. And the first question is, yeah, how to do that? Yeah, you would say with software. Yeah, software does everything. And the fact is that... Um, Software cannot do everything, so it needs smart engineering. And as you see with these robots, which all can comply in some way or the other, you see that this is something which is, um, as you can say, um, very context dependent. So every engineer has a different solution here. And so what you see here is one robot from the ETH in Zurich. It's called Animal. Um, it's uh, from Anibotics, actually, and they use SEAs, Series Elastic Actuators. The other thing is here, that's a um, cobot from FUP, F and NP um, Personal Robotics. It's a startup in Zurich. Um, well, it's not so much a startup anymore. I think they have already um, quite, quite a number of employees. And here, um, we see a gripper from the EPFL, 
which is soft in itself, but it introduces another concept in mechanical impedance is that mechanical impedance, unlike electrical impedance, is a multidimensional quantity, which means in electrical impedance, I have a resistor and it has a resistance, very easy. It's a single dimensional point, yeah? In mechanical impedance, I have to ask, what is the impedance with respect to X, to Y, to Z, and to the three rotational degrees of freedom? And what we see here, for example, is something which is very soft in terms of the gripping here. It's an electrostatic gripper which goes around the strawberry, can take it, but which cannot be bent in the other directions and which cannot be elongated. So it's only compliant in one direction and stiff in the at least four other directions and I think not so stiff in one other rotational direction. It's more or less like that. Yeah? So you can engineer dimension-dependent impedances. To make things worse, you can say that if you elongate in one point, you get something in the other point. So the mechanical impedance as opposed to electrical impedance is actually a matrix which is six by six. This doesn't make things easier but it makes more fun if you are an engineer, yeah? So you can show off and, and show how intelligent you are, especially to management. You say, look, I've some, done something and you don't understand it, and for that reason, you give me a raise. <laughs> um, now, the concept is first to say, get the mechanics right. So you don't start with software. Normally you would say I make a control loop, I adjust the P, the I and D parameters, but that's I think the last thing you should do. The first thing is you get the mechanics right. That means look at your problem. Is the problem a problem which needs compliance already? Yeah, so do you walk on soft terrain? Do you expect to walk on soft terrain, for example? Then an SEA would make sense, a serious elastic actuator. What does a serious elastic actuator do? It changes natural impedance of a motor with a gear, which is very stiff, to something which is very soft. So control becomes much easier if the starting point is already near the desired point. The farther you are away from the desired point, the higher the control frequency must become. Then you can say, okay, also you adjust the mass. So if you want something very stiff, you will have a high mass. Yeah, so you see these big precision turning tables which have a lot of mass, granite everywhere, you know, tons of granite. And so you, you have a high mass. And on the other hand, if you want to have a soft gripper, you make something which is as, uh, as light as possible. And this here is very lightweight. Yeah, so you see already here a lot of engineering going on. And the same thing applies to damping. Natural damping is much, much easier than adjusting the D parameter in your control loop. So you should introduce natural damping if you can. And some SCAs, for example, they use a damper actually also as a means to measure elongation. So they have a damper which also changes its electrical impedance and by this virtue, you can already measure the elongation and so you have a dual loop encoder if you want. Then the next thing is use tendons if you can afford it. So that means if you look at our hands, for example, which can be very, very agile, this agility is achieved only because we have tendons. Imagine all the muscles which I have in the forearm being in the hand, in the end effector. It wouldn't work out. Yeah? And so the point is the same with the robots. If we have the motors in the end effector, the robot will become clumsy necessarily. If we can remove the actuator from the end effector, then we can reduce the moved mass and with that we can lower the impedance. Yeah, so again, less terminator effect if we're using tendons. Then we go to motors with very low inertia. And I had a very nice chat also with Tom yesterday and uh, he will be presenting also about how to optimize a robot and um, I will leave most of the talk about that to him. Uh, one thing I want to say, it is an engineering problem. It's not a maximization problem. So low inertia, yes, but if the motor is at the end effector, then you will have to take into account also the mass of the motor and the mass of the reductor and everything else. So the gear, the motor, the inertia, the hysteresis, the friction, all of that are kind of a multi-dimensional problem which you can optimize according to your needs. 
Then the next thing is you can use springs to have a balanced default state. What I'm meaning is this. For example, if you make an exoskeleton, and the exoskeleton has to work against gravity when you're doing like this here, yeah? And so the motor is always exerting a force without actually doing work. The motor will become very hot. So if you can put a spring to remove the known part of the problem, that's a very good approach. Yeah, you have the same for scissors, for example. You have a scissor which opens and up and then closes down. So if you make a spring which goes to the medium position of the scissors, then the motor becomes much smaller. Yeah? So these are approaches where you say, okay, use all your brains you can and use all the low-tech uh, um, uh, elements which you have there and do all the tasks you can with low-tech elements and then, at the last point, introduce your high-tech element named software and fast control. And then, last thing is, use very high-efficiency gears. Why? We want to control F over V. F is a force. If you have low efficiency gears, the problem is you have, to, you have no idea about F. So you don't control the force, you have hysteresis, and hysteresis is a nightmare for control engineers. Then, at the last, use good sensors, maybe also very cheap sensors, maybe very ingenious sensors, but use sensors to know your system and use electronics and use software. The question is only how, how to do that. Um, now, let's go to the components. First thing, motors. The key requirement of a motor is low mechanical time constant, at least prima facie. That means if you use tendons, it's low mechanical time constant. The other things, I refer also to Tom here, uh, the low mechanical time constant actually relates high force to low inertia. And low inertia and high force means that the apparent mass of the robot is low. And the point is, for example, if you have an exoskeleton, then the agility of the actuator has to match the agility of our muscles. Otherwise, we will be always battling against the robot, against the exoskeleton. And for that reason, you need mechanical time constants in the region of two to three milliseconds or below. It's not a panacea. If you have too long time constants, then you have other problems like, for example, control loops where the electrical and the mechanical time constant are the same, which makes things very difficult. But let's say as a, as a, as a figure, it would be advisable to get to two or three milliseconds mechanical time constant or lower, and then you're matching more or less the way our muscles are built. The other requirements which are context dependent are low friction, low cogging torque, low weight, and a high torque density. And these are requirements which sometimes contradict each other. So if you want a extremely high torque density, you will have a high cogging torque. If you remove the cogging torque, uh, you will remove part of the torque. Yeah, so the question is really, what do we need at the end of the day? And then for that reason, there are many motors and there are many motor firms and I think there are many approaches to the problems and that's the reason why they exist. If there was the one single most best motor, we would sell this motor. And our catalog wouldn't be that big. It would be a small catalog. But actually, these things are context dependent. And again here, it's just a pointer to engineering. You're all, I, I assume, are engineers. And so your work is safe for the next 20 years at least. Yeah? <laughs> then for gears, impedance control, we said F over V. Yeah? So we want to know F. We want also to know V. If we have backlash, I don't know the force and I don't know the speed, at least at a certain point. So if I have backlash, I can preload the gear, then this is another thing. So I can use springs to preload it, but if I cannot use that, then I would need a gear with a very low backlash. And high efficiency I talked about. And then there are things like low noise, because if you're talking about Lukobas, you don't want to unnerve the people you're working with, and lightweight and compactness. And again here, these things are contradicting each other. So something which is very low weight will probably not be the most efficient thing. Yeah? So you have, have to trade off. Now here there are gears. This is uh, some part of gears which you see here. Here is a very low noise gear which is not that efficient but extremely low noise. That's a coax drive bias. 
This is a planetary gear which is very compact, has a high torque density, and here you have a spur gear which is extremely efficient. So these are the, the three approaches. There are new approaches coming from us in the following time. So let's say in, in one or two months you will see some new releases which also go for lower friction, so higher efficiency at the same size and also lower play. And then you have the whole thing up to really zero play. Uh, gears which are st still done high here by harmonic drive and I had very good chats also with uh, Chris from harmonic drive and uh, so I think he will be talking too later on so let's look forward to that also sensors the sensors need to be very very fast so what you could call encoders and there is also a tendency, you know, to, to take the very best encoder that is on the market and to use that encoder. The problem is that the resolution you have on the encoder is not the resolution that you get. And the reason is very simple. You have an encoder. If it's a third-party encoder, it will have some kind of inertia. It will have an own ball bearing. And this will introduce friction. Friction and inertia introduces dynamical hysteresis. And that's the reason why you will have more problems with these things. So sometimes a lower resolution, but a built-in encoder might beat an external encoder with an extremely high resolution. Still, we have worked on our encoders also, and here the same thing is true. We have here an optical encoder. So uh, this one has quite a high number of pulses, and it should serve most of your purposes. If you still need to go higher, just bear in mind, OK, take the whole calculation. So still go for a compact encoder. Don't take the biggest encoder with, you know, a bazillion number of points because you don't get that bazillion number of points in reality. Then we have also speed sensors and acceleration sensors. A speed sensor is also called a tachometer or so. An acceleration sensor is kind of a Ferrari sensor. And the question is, why do you need an acceleration sensor if you have an encoder? And the answer is, an encoder, if you take acceleration, you take a double differentiation. So a single differentiation, which is already speed, is noise, yeah? because it's something minus something, and then the difference is very small, and you have noise. And acceleration is noise squared, if you want. And for that reason, sensors that give you acceleration um, are very in fashion, uh, say, for high-end robotics, and if you really want to do very good impedance control. They come, however, with some price which you have to pay, and the price you pay is actually that these Ferrari sensors also are dampers because they are working on the eddy current principle, and so they introduce damping to your system. So it's a kind of inefficiency. If you love the damping, it's very good. If you don't love the damping, you have to take other approaches. And there are also other acceleration sensors now today, which are MEMS-type sensors, which don't have that problem. And they measure rather the acceleration, say, in the end effector than in, in, in the end in world coordinates and not in the robotic coordinates. And force sensors, there are a lot of force sensors, but a force sensor normally, you cannot measure force. You normally will measure a elongation. So you have a soft element which changes some kind of impedance. And you, will have, you have seen many of these things. And one of the things here is a conductive film. Um, I think 3M sells them or so. Yeah, So it's a kind of rubber which you use for make, uh, measuring pressure. And if you match the thickness of the rubber to the time constant of your motor, then you can get a gripper which can stop full stop when the rubber is really compressed. Yeah, so the rubber gives you, uh, via its resistance, an indication of the force, and at the same time is adding compliance to the system so that you can control it. And here, this is from Komuro Robotics Lab. I think you may YouTube, uh, you look at the YouTube videos of Komuro, these uh, hands which extremely fast can grab some cell phone or so. They are quite old already, and it is amazing what they did with the technology that was there some years ago. And one thing, excuse me, uh, well, coming back to this here. Um, here, this is another publication which says, look, you have here a natural impedance, and the impedance range which you can have goes something like 20 dB per decade. So the point is that if you are far away from this natural impedance, from the frequency at which it occurs, 
then you have a large impedance range. That means that the faster you are, the farther away your critical frequency is, the better you are. So control, if you have Kalman observers, all other kinds, you have all this kind of modern stuff that you have. You have very advanced mathematics and sometimes lose sight of the very basic requirements. And one of the basic requirements is a high transition frequency because you cannot beat this here. And the reason is because that's pure mathematics. This is the relationship between angle and the impedance, um, how do you call uh, the, the, the way impedance behaves, so how many dB per decade you have. And if you want to change impedance more abruptly, you need to extract information from the system, so it's a matter of information, and you cannot get that information. And for that reason, you need to be farther away in frequency. So you cannot beat that. So if somebody claims, you know, yeah, we have here a control frequency of 100 hertz, and at 10 hertz we have an impedance range of 1,000 to 1, you have to say it's impossible. It's mathematically impossible. And if they claim that, normally they have forgotten something. You cannot beat the mathematics behind that. And that's very important. So that's the reason why we need very fast sensors, very fast motors, very fast controllers, and very fast software if we do want to do things by software. If we don't want to do that, then we need smart mechanics. So another comp uh, component is the controller. And the controller, there are three key requirements. They have to be fast, fast, and fast. And well, fast also means well synchronized. If they are not well synchronized, so for example, if the encoder has his clock and the controller has another clock, and many modern encoders have a built-in clock, which doesn't make things easier, then you will have interference effects. You will have beats, things like that. If the controllers are not synchronized, same thing. So you need to have something with the Martha clock or something where you have a defined cycle, and then you're done. If you don't do that, we have something which we call the Parkinson effect. You have a robot which is behaving like this, and you put a microscope to the robot, so a micro robot, something like that, and you see it has a nominal tolerance of 200 nanometers, and then you see something like this, this behavior. So it's always one micrometer off, yeah? So you point the microscope, and you always ask yourself, what, what's, what's happening here, yeah? And then you trace down the problem, and then you find out it's a problem of clock synchronization. So synchronizing the clocks is of paramount importance if you want to do precise and good control. And also here, there are things coming out now, and this here is a 7015 from our series here with EtherCAT, and here is a, something which can control 50 volts and 8 amps. So this is a power density which we really went for. Our customers asked for it, and we did it. And so this is something which is upcoming now, and there are many other controls, of course. Um, here, as I said, synchronization, I think, is more or less equivalent to some kind of industrial Ethernet. We chose EtherCAT because we can then map the CAN objects very easily to it and you get all the luxury of the CAN bus over the Ethernet. Now, examples for subsystems. As I said, the normal approach would be very fast sensors, very fast controllers, very fast encoders, very fast motors. So they take everything and they take gold, 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 platinum, Super platinum, osmium, I don't know, iridium. You know, take the most precious metals you have everywhere, yeah, and they say, that's my system, yeah. And then some management guy says, yeah, and who pays for that? And so for that reason, people have come up with ingenious ideas. One of them is the SEA, the Series Elastic Actuator. And that's what I said before. You have something where you have an impedance which doesn't match the natural impedance, and to come back here to these things here, yeah, so if you start off at the right impedance, so if you move this one here down here already, and the desired impedance is also something like this here, you're much, much better, yeah? So impedance control is a range here, but the range only at a low frequency. The higher the frequency is, the more you get to the, des uh, to the natural impedance, so you change the natural impedance to something very soft, and then you have soft broadband behavior, what you are actually desiring. And Series lasses actuators, by the way, are very difficult to control. One company that does them is uh, Anibotics, which I showed before. They are 
doing this uh, any drive, which is a very decent series elastic actuator and has a very good bandwidth. It's very well engineered. And okay, they spent, I think, uh, several PhD theses on that and uh, I think tens of man years on, on, on optimizing that. Yeah, so I said, it's, it's not, it's not, uh, you know, it's for adults here. It's not for children, this kind of engineering. Another thing, which is also very complicated but very ingenious, is a Makepa. You use that today, uh, it's a state of the art for um, exoskeletons. So I told you before, yeah, you want an exoskeleton to have an equilibrium position which is configurable. You want something which can match the muscles and as you know, your legs can change impedance quite quickly. And now, how can you change the impedance mechanically? That's the way a Makepa is functioning. So Makepa actually ha means mechanically adjustable compliance, which means that you have a spring here of which you can um, in a way, uh, adjust the angle. And by adjusting the angle of the spring, you can adjust the apparent stiffness. And the other thing you can adjust is the equilibrium position so that the motor doesn't have to work against the equilibrium all the time. And if you do that, the motors that you need for a Makepa are much, much smaller than for a classical exoskeleton joint. However, you need more motors and more mechanics and you need very, very intelligent control systems. And today's control systems are, say, less, less adapted to that, so also here you need more software, more engineers. However, the whole system, if it's done right, gives a much better experience for the patient. And if you wanted to do that just with a motor and a software controller, it would be close to impossible. And so for that reason, I think a Makepa is a very, very good example of impedance control in practice where you use a combination of ingenious mechanics with very good software and very good sensors, very good motors, and then you have a good system. But the system is still payable. Another thing is something which we dubbed the haptic drive. It is a double differential rheological actuator. Uh, this is something where you could say you have a motor and you have a double clutch drive with very, very low inertia. One clutch going one direction, one clutch going the other direction. And then you, uh, uh, you can imagine you would be sitting in a car and you have two clutches and one is in reverse and one is in forward and you want to get out of the snow and you could do it very finely. You know, you could then play with that. That's a, this uh, haptic drive. We've done that. Um, Perhaps we'll pick up this project again. <coughs> Truth be told, it's a little bit expensive, this drive, but I think there are still applications in robotics where you need very good impedance control. And this one comes with two natural impedances. One is high and one is low, and you can change the impedances within the range of one or two milliseconds. And within three milliseconds, you can do a full speed reverse from one direction to the other. Well, the conclusion is impedance control needs one thing, creative engineering, it needs you, it needs brains, um, there is no easy solution, there's no panacea, and however it's very fun to do and I think that's the future where it's going and also the future where I think acceptable robotics are going, cobots are going and everything else. So if there are any questions, please tell me. Yep, no question means nobody has understood a word, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ah, there. This one here, coax drive. Yeah. The input stage is actually um, a polymer um, how to say gear here, and it is inclined. And so you have an input stage, you have a, a normal gear, and then you have the polymer which is inclined, and it is a hybrid between a planetary gear and a worm screw. So by this inclination, you get the action of a worm screw, which is much less noisy and has a little bit more reduction, however, it is a little bit less efficient. Mm -hmm. 
I'm glad you asked, yeah. Um, linear motors have their pros and cons. And actually, if you're using a linear motor as a direct drive, it's a very, very sensible thing to do. Um, you can imagine a linear motor as being like a circular motor, but unwound. So you have a circular motor and you unwind all the poles and then you get a linear motor. So in a way, it's a very inefficient use of resources because you need all the poles. Yeah? So you have many, many poles and you need more poles than you actually need. However, um, our world is more or less Cartesian. Yeah, it's not round. Well, in, you know, in large scale, it's very round. But uh, here, small scale, uh, you're walking on level terrain. And here, the walls are going vertically. So we are quite Cartesian in a way of thinking. Yeah, it's either horizontal or vertical. And the linear motors directly give you that motion. And if you have a rotation motor, you always need to convert the rotation to something linear. And this conversion often takes a gear or an arm or something like that. And there, you lose precision. And with a linear motor, you don't have that drawback. So it's, say, a balance between a high weight of a linear motor as opposed to a rotational motor, but having a direct drive, a direct approach to your environment, and therefore being able to control that much more directly. So, for example, a linear motor is a base motor for a robot, makes sense. I wouldn't say it makes sense for an end effector, unless you really know what you're doing. There are some cases where a linear motor makes sense, for example, for pick-and-place applications. And here, again, it's more the clumsiness of uh, rotational things then converted to linear motion where direct linear motion is better. Yeah. Uh, did it answer more or less your question? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Richard. Where do you see, um, more from a manufacturing standpoint, the challenges based on the different technologies that are available? Excuse me. Um, Yeah. Let's say um, motors are difficult to manufacture, otherwise everybody would do it. I think that that doesn't change too much. Um, if you want to go to extremely low con time constants, there are concepts which are there already, which are even more difficult to manufacture and which are outrageously expensive. So sometimes you're really hitting the wall and saying, okay, this, this um, doesn't make sense anymore economically. With respect to the rest, you know, for example, these uh, flex prints, they're quite cheap, or the springs in a series elastic actor, they're also quite cheap. However, you need some tooling sometimes. And what I'm l a little bit fearing is that there are too many variants then in future. This can be good if you are really accustomed to lot size one, uh, but this can be bad if you're looking for large volumes. So I think impedance control will always be context dependent, and it will more go into the lot size one manufacturing style. And if your company is adapted to that, all the better. I think Maxon has gone a long way to go to this lot size one thing. And um, for large volumes, lot size one is not that efficient. But for sm small volumes and fast delivery, you will need that. And I think this is the, the point. I think we talked also the last days about delivery times in, in robotics. And the key feature will be how fast can you adapt to your customer. It's much, much more important tomorrow than today, I would say. Mm -hmm. Thank you also. Technology has long been a disruptive force. During the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution altered the world profoundly and permanently. During the 20th century, mass production and electricity reshaped manufacturing, giving rise to large, slow-moving global manufacturers. Today, there are new forces at work, and they're changing the world around us, especially in the field of automation. Thanks to technology, the most successful and disruptive organizations consist of a small nucleus of people with a BHAG, a disruptive technology, and a laser-focused strategy. Today's innovative machine builders and robotics trailblazers are leaping ahead of the competition by thinking big and acting nimbly. As an automation disruptor, understanding what products to integrate into your machine is critical to your success in the 21st century.
But with so many emerging technologies, chances are you need someone to help lead the way. That's where we come in. At Electromate, we spend our days helping manufacturers like you build better machines. This is why we exist. Electromate has dedicated teams made up of the best mechanical and electrical engineers in the field. We work in harmony with your engineers to help you design and build custom, high-quality, automated machinery. This is what matters to us. We are proud to offer an extensive catalog of cutting-edge robotic and mechatronic technologies, the combination of which is unique to Electromate. From the harshest conditions above or below ground to the highest accuracy and precision motion control applications, our solutions are unmatched in performance and value. No business is an island. There's no need to fend for yourself. Utilize Electromate's engineering expertise to complement your engineering team and get your product to market faster with less hassle. Our core purpose is to help manufacturers compete globally by building better machines using differentiated automation technology. This is our culture. This is our commitment to you. What's your core purpose? If you want to build a better machine, come talk to us. To learn more about what we have to offer, visit www.electromate.com today. Electromate provides motion control at the speed of technology.